everyone. Welcome back to Crime Weekly News. I'm Derek Lavasser. And I'm Stephanie Harlow. And unfortunately, we got a sad one tonight. This is a crazy story. Crazy that this can even happen in these times, but it is. That's why we're covering it. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's a, the, we have to talk about these things because as parents and as members of society, we got to be aware of this because clearly things are slipping through the cracks and this is a prime example of it right here. So on July 20th of this year, 26-year-old Zachary Scheich of Lincoln, Nebraska was arrested on felony charges of sexual assault, use of an electronic device, and sex trafficking of a minor. Now, you might think, oh, that's something, unfortunately, I hear all the time. There's a lot more to this story. It gets a lot scarier than this. And Stephanie's going to tell you about it. Yeah, as I was reading this story, which is, you know, obviously just just happening, just coming out now, the entire time they were giving the details, I was like, how did this happen? How did this happen? It's 2023. Everything's electronic. Everything is, you know, available to you at the touch of a button. This isn't, you know, even the, the 70s when you could like D.B. Cooper get on a plane without giving your real name. Right. This isn't Never Been Kissed where Drew Barrymore as an adult goes to high school and poses as a, a kid and it's a movie. This is real life. So what happened is we we found out in a recently released arrest affidavit um, that the Lincoln police in Nebraska discovered that Zachary had created false documents and an elaborate backstory to pass himself off as a 17 year old, a 17 year old student. And he didn't attend just one high school. He attended two high schools over the course of the 2022-2023 school year, and he used – he didn't even use his real name. He used an alias, a completely fake name, Zach Hess. So it looks like he started off at Northwest High School before transferring to Southeast High School. And during that time, he was in contact with multiple underage girls and he had inappropriate contact with many juvenile students on school property. And the documents specifically detail two relationships with two different teens. But it appears as the story is gaining traction and becoming more public, more people are coming forward, more young people are coming forward and and also saying that they had interactions with him as well. So the documents specifically detail a relationship in February where he asked a 14-year-old girl if she would engage in sexual acts with him. And in March, he asked a 13-year-old girl to meet up with him for sex. He asked her if she would lose her virginity to him and if she would send him sexually explicit photos in exchange for money. And police did find one record of a payment being exchanged between the two. So it looks like something of that nature happened. And keep in mind, He's posing as a 17-year-old student. And I would say, as a parent, as a person, a human being, I think it's still inappropriate for a 17-year-old to have a sexual relationship with a 14-year-old or 13-year-old girl. But he wasn't 17. He was 26. So he's like a, a sex predator who who found a loophole to to literally have a hunting ground, to have complete access to a hunting ground where he could pretend he was a high school student, 17, of course, not 18, because then that would make it really illegal and those relationships would be you know, very illegal and, and frowned down upon. And he found this loophole because the Lincoln public school system has said that they do require birth certificates or other proof of identity, as well as transcripts and vaccination records when a new student enrolls. But because of federal laws that protect students who are homeless, the district is legally required to take any student who claims to be under 21 years of age, even if they do not have proper documentation. And please tell me how that makes sense at all. <laughs> like, at all. Because I understand there are, there are cases where, you know, you might have a teenager who is experiencing homelessness, and yet this teenager wants to be able to get an education uh, through the public school system. But then I feel like there would be steps taken to verify in some way or the other that this student was, A, in fact, experiencing homelessness, and B, the age that he said he was. Like maybe they would question people who knew him or people who had interactions with him. They would actually go and like see if he was experiencing homelessness. Like I understand the need to – you know, want to allow homeless teens to get an education, but to just completely be like, well, everyone else has to follow the rules. But if you say you're homeless and you say you're under the age of 21, come on in. Come on in. We're not going to check in any way, shape or form. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And and honestly, I think that the school system probably should have done more of, more of their due diligence and didn't. And kind of now it's like they're just trying to blame it on this like state law. And they're like, well, we didn't know. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to let everyone in. So I don't, I don't get, I don't get it personally. You'd rather 
protect like the, you know, the, I guess, rare incidents of a homeless teen wanting to go to high school, then protect every single girl in that high school from a predator who's pretending to be a homeless teen? I have no problem with the law because of what it's intended to do. The law is intended as exactly how it sounds to help homeless children get an education. I don't think anybody has an issue with that. My issue with is with the vetting process. First off, was it followed? Because maybe there is a strict vetting process that goes into place when someone comes in and claims that they're homeless and that they, they're looking for an education. And maybe there's this very strict process that's supposed to be followed and wasn't. And in that case, some people are going to get fired and probably sued. What so if there's that, not a vetting process? There's not a vetting process. What if there isn't? I'm asking. So you. if there isn't a vetting process, then that's the other problem, right? That's another problem where now the school's getting sued, not necessarily the individual who didn't do their job. So if there's if there's a law that requires it, that's one thing. Well, we don't know if the school's getting sued. That no, no. It. I'm saying that it, that I I believe personally the suit that if I'm the parents, I'm suing the school. Yes. If they, it's their responsibility as administrators to develop policies to enact these laws. So how you know? Yeah, to there's a law you have to kids. follow. But yeah. protect the kids that are already there. And also, let's just say for an example, it is true. Why is this child homeless? What is the backstory here? Is there any type of mental illness that they need to be aware of? How did this child at 17 years old uh, become homeless and now living on their own with what it seems like no relatives to, to take care of them? Nobody around, no family members. So you would think at, at the core, for the sake of that child, you would want to try to help them not only get an education, which is obviously important, but also find out the root of the issue and see if you can help them there so that when they leave school that day or every other day, they have a place to go. And, and as a school, you can help with that. So there's some things there. But I also think this is a bigger thing that I, I that as a parent, I had dealt with something not exactly like this, but similar to a certain degree. I don't think a lot of you out there already assume this, but for anybody who does, and this is not only, I'm not attacking schools. This is like in any profession, including police departments. I'll speak for my own. There were people who were in charge of me that were absolute morons, and <laughs> but they get in, they become you know, lieutenants or sergeants because of attrition and because they just were there longer than you. And so that's in any job, right? And so don't just assume that because these people in these school systems are in those positions of authority that they know what they're doing. At the end of the day, no one's going to truly protect your child like you are. And so ask questions. Be curious. Be a pain in the ass. And, and the example I wanted, was going to say was my children were at a, were at a different school um, before the school they're at now. And there was a school shooting that happened. And I started thinking about that school shooting and how our school uh, had a very similar vulnerabilities to that. And I'm not saying I'm the you know, be, you know, end all be all when it comes to this type of thing. But if you look me up, I got a little bit of experience in this area, you know, might be something you would use. People pay me some to talk about these things. You would think that if I reach out to you and say, hey, I'm willing to come in and kind of look through the school and see what we can do for a reasonable price. And by the way, I'm willing to pay for it um, to better protect all the students here. I even volunteered to have Dr. Chris Mohandi from Breaking Homicide, who is an expert in this field, who has written books about it, who gets paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to go in and consult about it, uh, would come for free, would come for free. And uh, I got an email after about three or four attempts from uh, by me through that principal to, to kind of set this up where they basically just kept blowing me off. So that just op told me that ultimately the people in charge may have good intentions but didn't know what they were doing and I took my children out of that school. I didn't complain, I didn't do anything. I just took them out of the school and put them somewhere else. So although this isn't a school shooting, this is something where there are individuals at the schools across the country who may mean well, but don't necessarily have the motivation or the drive to enact the policies needed to protect your children appropriately. So take situations like this. Don't become paranoid. You don't want to be you don't want to get to a situation where you're sick sending your kids to school, but you want to be diligent and you want to be. You want to be a pain in the ass. I keep saying it. You want to be someone who is dotting the I's and checking, you know, and crossing the T's, making sure that things that are supposed to be being done at the school are being done. And don't just assume they are because this can happen in other places. And to me, it's just a, this is a simple example of somebody dropped the ball here. I don't know who it was yet, but we're going to find out. I'm sure these parents are going to find out. It's probably going to be through civil litigation, but this is a bigger issue that I think all of us can pull from to better equip ourselves for similar situations that could happen in our own lives. 
So I guess what I want you like I, you say somebody dropped the ball. Oh yeah. What if nobody dropped the ball and what if there's literally no vetting process and like this this thing said they're legally required to allow any student who claims to be under the age of 21 and who claims to be experiencing homelessness to attend and enroll school without the proper documentation. What if that's all that they have to do? Fair enough. This is what I would say. What does it allow them to do? Well, what does it force them to do? It, it requires them to provide an education for that homeless child, correct? Yes. It doesn't say that they immediately have to be integrated with every other student until they're fully vetted. Within that building, as the principal of that school, I am ultimately going to make the decision as to how that child, any child for that matter, even if it's a transfer, is coming into the school and being integrated into the existing community. I'm going to vet that person, whether they claim to be homeless or not. Even if they're just coming from another school, I want to know their history. I want to know why they're coming here. I want to know their records from that other school. I want to do uh, interviews with the family members. I want to get an understanding of That's who this I'm child saying. is. Right. So once they end, so you may have no choice whether or not to give them, provide them an education, which I don't necessarily disagree with. But as the school administrator, I would set up a policy within my walls that say, "Hey, listen, we are required to take on these new students. However, we're going to have a holding period, if you will, where we set up another school, another room, classroom for these students, so they can start getting their education." While we're going through the I vetting process. I think that process. would be considered like discrimination, honestly. Sue me. Administrators can do whatever they want. It doesn't mean that the person who is affected by it can't come out and file a complaint or file a lawsuit or whatever. But that's how you develop new policy. That's how new legislation gets developed. But ultimately, I'm willing as the principal or as a school administrator to say, hey, this individual is coming to the school. I don't know who they are. They don't have any documentation to prove who they are. And what they do have, it's very minimal. Uh, my responsibility is to provide an education to the student and also protect the well-being of all the existing students. This student is not happy with the fact that for a week or two, I'm requiring them to be in an intake classroom with other students, maybe, but older, whatever it might be, or specific teachers, just until we finish the process of getting them signed up, getting them enrolled with the specific teacher, making sure we have all the documentation, making, making sure that they're set up and ready to go. We're not ostracizing them. We're not penalizing them, but we have an, a, a holding period where it's not like you come through those doors and you're automatically in. There's no vetting process. There's going to be a little bit of a delay before you're fully with the other student body. Now, that 17-year-old student come back, could come back and say, oh, you're discriminating against me. Go for it. I think a lot of parents, including myself, would be defending that principle saying, hey, listen, I appreciate you vetting these individuals before allowing them to be in classrooms with everyone else. They're more than likely going to be fine, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And oh, by the way, we have a history of this in articles like this where this shit can happen. So don't tell me that I'm crazy because it does happen. And, and I think the principal would have a lot of people defending them if that were the case. But if I had to bet, Stephanie, I would say it's not just like, hey, you got to take them in no matter what. Just slap them on the back and let them go to class. I would my guess would be that they let them in because it's the law and it, it, everyone pointed the finger at everyone else as to who was to vet this person or get them you know, checked out. And everyone said, hey, not my problem. And they kind of slipped through the cracks. That's my guess. So he does look very young. I will say that. He does. I agree with that. And and kids today that are 18, by the way, they look, some of them look like they're 30. Yeah, I agree. So um, I, I looked him up and I found him on LinkedIn. He, he says he's an esports tournament organizer manager. He's an avid video game influencer. Oh, and also he's a YouTube video editor. So um, he's, he, his main focus is Call of Duty and Halo. And, um, yeah, he feels like he can give valuable information on features that games should be added to. <laughs> so I I don't know, man. Like the, to me, this is clearly um, a case of somebody, an older person. I mean, 26, man. OK, 26, who said, I really am attracted to younger girls. And how can I have access to any of them that I want? Because why else would you do it? Yeah. You know, why else? Would he, and they said he didn't even go to school that much. I think over the total of that 2022, 2023 year, he was there like 58 days, which is another thing that I feel like at that point, the school should no, be this like. this is a predatorial thing for sure. Right. Like this is purpose. This is a Trojan horse. Yeah. You're not like suffering from some mental health thing that made you actually think you were a high school student and, and enroll in high school. 
you went there specifically with the point of making those high schools your hunting ground and you succeeded and somebody has to answer for this besides Zachary at this point. Like, obviously, he needs to answer for it. But whoever allowed the wolf into, like, the the the, the field of sheep needs to answer for how he slipped past them when all they had to do was say, like, oh, you kind of look like a wolf. Let me let me check into this for a minute. Yeah. Like, you know, but let even me, if give they me a don't, couple of days. Even if it's like a, f- a four foot tiny little person who looks sweet and innocent and there just has to be a process for everyone regardless of how they look right that that would be discriminatory but hey this is our policy we are required to take you in we want we welcome you with open arms we want to get you hooked up here's some textbooks here's going to be your classroom this isn't going to be your permanent classroom this is an intake classroom where as we're going through the process getting you your student id getting your books getting your schedule getting you making sure you have all the Whatever, um, this is, a, I'm a polarizing topic here, making sure you have the proper vaccines or whatever that are required by state to be at the school if it's a public school, like all those things, like just, you know, making sure that you're ready to go. And, and that's another thing. Like you're telling me that any other student who's not experiencing homelessness and comes in, if they don't have their vaccines, they're <laughs> yeah. not going to be, or, you know, right. you know, any proper documentation, if they can't prove who they are, that's why I they're feel not like going to be. The ball here. They're not going to be allowed in, but some rando shows up and is like, hey, I'm Zach and I'm 17, but I can't prove it, but I don't have a home to live in. And they're like, come on in, dude. Yeah. Like, that's there's not gotta, fair either. More, it sounds like there's more to the story to me. Either there's a policy in place and it wasn't followed or there's no policy in place. Both are wrong because I think yeah. there's, a, there's a law, but then obviously the schools at the school level have a responsibility as administrators to, de- to develop policies and procedures that not only afford a better education for the students, but also protect them from themselves and others. So I'm looking at the law itself. It says uh, they're prohibited on segregating homeless students. I agree with that. And that's why you can't do it. You can't segregate them where these are all the regular students and these are the homeless kids. Well, they probably would consider an intake classroom while they verify this homeless student story to be segregation of some kind. 100%. Again, listen, maybe I'm being thick-headed. Sue me. This is a very short period of time. I'm talking like a week where a caseworker would be assigned to that student. They would be interviewing them. They would be facilitating whatever they need to make sure that they're being taken care of in the school and outside the school. They would go down to the you know, city hall or the state to get documents on this child to make sure that they are who they say they are, to, to all those things. And it would be a very quick process. Like I said, maybe a week tops because that would be someone's job to do immediately before that student is enrolled in, a, in a, an official class all year long. Or it could be even something where during the time that they're in class, there's someone assigned to them to make as a caseworker who's checking in class to class, really keeping close tabs on them. Whatever it might be, again, it's not my job. The moral of the story for me here is these administrators are responsible for taking care of your kids. And whether it's the law or the policy or just ineptness by one of these individuals who work there, someone dropped the ball here. This guy got through the cracks. This, I don't care how he looks, this should have been picked up on. And if if it wasn't, then maybe the law needs to be amended. That's also a possibility where the ball was dropped at the legislative level. Whatever it is, clearly something like this should happen never, but it, if it does happen, it should only happen once. I mean, yeah, I'm looking, I'm reading this PDF and it's long, so I could be missing something, but everything I'm seeing pretty much says, everything I'm seeing pretty much looks like it's trying to protect the homeless youth Fair from enough. discrimination of any kind. And there's really nothing in here about protecting everyone else from a potential wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, you know what the great thing about laws are? Judges use this all the time, they're open to interpretation. That's what's great about those. So as an administrator, I'm going to interpret the way that law is written, how I think it is interpreted. I'm going to enact it that way that I'm interpreting it. And until someone comes to me legally and says otherwise, I'm going to do what I think as an administrator is best for the school. And again, there may become something that comes up civilly that changes that, but I'm not going to ostracize anybody, any child, but there are, I think there are ways to do things where the child doesn't feel like they're being segregated from everyone else. But at the same time, you're still protecting all the children that are already under your responsibility. Okay, so listen to this. It says, in general, the school selected in accordance with this paragraph shall immediately enroll the homeless child or youth, even if the child or youth is unable to produce records normally required for enrollment, such as previous academic records, 
records of immunization and other required health records, proof of residency or other documentation, or even if they've missed the application or enrollment deadlines during any period of homelessness. It says the enrolling school shall immediately contact the school last attended by the child or youth to obtain relevant academic and other records. That did not happen because this dude went to Lincoln Public School schools when he he graduated in like 2015. So either he told them he'd never been to school before or I don't know. He gave a complete And if he's never been to school before, then he probably can't be in an, uh, what did he say he was, 17? 17. So he's like a junior? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, you're not. maybe they put him in the freshman classes because he's he's like associating with like 13 and 14 year olds. How do we know he's even capable? If he's never been to school, how's he going to do even freshman level work? If he doesn't have basic writing and, yeah, and reading it, skills. It looks like somebody... Uh, somebody dropped the ball, for sure. Someone's ball. getting fired, and then the school's getting sued, for sure. That's my mm-hmm. guess, anyways. Yeah. Pisses me off, but say the least. And again, immediately enroll him. Interpretation, immediately. yes. Immediately. We'll yeah. immediately enroll him. It doesn't mean I'm going to take someone from a, from outside the school, walk through the doors, and throw him in a classroom. It I'll says even if they can't like find the information they're looking for or if there's a dispute, the youth still has to be immediately enrolled in the school pending resolution of pending resolution of each dispute. Crazy. Well, if it's at the school level, I feel bad for the families because obviously those children will never be the same. And these parents now are responsible for picking up the pieces. So. I Can you hope. imagine, though, like you find out your 13 or 14 year old daughter yeah. is in communication with a 17 year old even and the 17 year old is asking her for like explicit pictures yeah, and, to pay her, and asking that's to take bad. her virginity. And you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe a 17 year old is doing it. And then you find out that this person's not 17. They are 26. Yeah, no, that person, <sighs> they're lucky they're in custody. We'll just say that they're lucky they're in custody real quickly because this story is terrible. I hope that the school, that whoever is responsible for this gets held responsible. I hope that the family sues the shit out of them. Gets a ton of money, and uh, it'll come from the it'll come from most likely the city or the state, which is unfortunate. But the taxpayers will have to pay for that one. But a lot of people will be fired, especially the ones who weren't doing their job. So real quickly, we were talking before we started recording. I know that you said you just released a video on Carly Russell. Did that go yes. live yet? All right. Yes. So you have a video out. I'm sure it's an in depth video about Carly Russell. For I think everybody knows who Carly Russell is. Obviously, you can give him a 20 second download if you want, but go check out Stephanie's video if you haven't. She's clearly going to catch you up to speed. But I just wanted to get your opinion on it for everybody who has a general understanding of what's going on. And and you can give them that first if you want. Um, What you think about today's news that basically law enforcement has learned she was lying about the whole thing. None of it was true. Well, I think that Law enforcement was basically saying that in the press conference this past Wednesday oh, yeah. without saying it, right? Um, oh, yeah. We cannot verify her story. Um, th- we found these things on her phone. There were other things on her phone that spoke to her state of mind at the time, but we're not going to release that due to, you know, her concerns for her privacy. Even though I feel like if you fake your abduction and make yourself a public figure, you're probably no longer entitled to a level of privacy. You know, at that point, you've forced the public eye on you and had people worried about you, people praying for you, people literally thinking that she was like a human trafficking victim. And then, you know, psych, no, I just faked my kidnapping. And and I, I was talking in my video and I was like, maybe she, you know, try to give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she just wanted to get away. Maybe she just wanted to disappear for a couple of days. But if that's the case, why why make it this public? Why come up with this story and stage your car left on the side of the highway? And, you know, she claimed she saw a three-year-old toddler in a diaper wandering along the highway alone. She called 911. She left her car there. When they got there, her door was open. The car was running. Her cell phone was on the ground. Her purse was in the car. Why go to these lengths? And at the end of the day, because she wanted Attention, I think. Um, and y- you said today she came out and she admitted to, to you know, just faking the whole thing, right? Basically, from what I was reading uh, from the press conference is that she's, she hasn't cooperated with police at all. But it seems like through her attorney or through her family, she has informed the police department that there was no toddler. She was never abducted. She never left the area of Hoover. And she is apologetic for what she did and she's going to seek help in trying to, you know, better herself in the future. And she just asks for forgiveness. But um, there's still the law enforcement is contemplating whether or not to charge her. 
So what's your opinion on that? So I, well, first of all, I released my video today, but before, this just happened four hours ago, before she had come out and, and made a statement. And it looks like she made a statement through her attorney. Right. I said in my video today, people make mistakes. I get it. Um, I think it's obviously still wrong, but people make mistakes. I get it. I would have a lot of respect for her if she came forward and made a statement. This statement through her lawyer, in my opinion, is not adequate and not sufficient. I wanted her to make a statement, like get on the news, sit there, look at us, you know, like a real YouTuber, I messed up apology statement that we've seen hundreds, not hundreds, that's dramatic, dozens of YouTubers have to sit there and face the camera and face their audience and say, I'm sorry, and I messed up. I would have a lot of respect for her if she did that. It does not appear that she has done that or that she plans on doing it. I also heard that she was throwing like a birthday party for herself or Today, she was having some sort of birthday party. Whatever, yeah. yeah, in in Atlanta, I believe. So I kind of feel like at the end of the day, in my opinion, from what I know of Carly, and that's not a lot, just what's been reported and what I've seen through social media, she seems to be a little spoiled, a little entitled, a little bit immature and childish. And I think that this avoiding um, having accountability for what she did in, in the fact of like facing the people that she misled for so long. Um, I think that it, it shows, you know, another degree of immaturity. And if she really wanted to work on herself and if she's seeking help and hopes to better herself, this would have been a good place to start by giving a public apology because you made up a public kidnapping. So a public apology would have been appreciated. And I think, yeah, people would have still, still been pissed, but people like me would have been like, okay, we can move forward now. I, I see that you are ready to take accountability. And, you know, do I think she should be charged? Yeah, I think she should be charged with something. I don't want to see this go to poor, prison for the rest yeah, of her life. I don't want to see this poor girl like sit behind bars forever. But if Sherry Papini's got to do time, you know, then Carly Russell should have to do Agreed. some time. Um, and, 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 and in there lies a lesson that I think Carly Russell desperately needs to learn. Sometimes you have to really fall on your face and sometimes you have to face the consequences of your actions to understand that your actions were wrong because it doesn't appear to be innate for her. I think she does things, messes up, gives a shallow apology. And in the past, people have let her get away with that because she's supposed to, you know, she's an attractive young girl. She's supposed to be very uh, charismatic, very warm, loving. And and she probably has gotten away with a lot of things in the past. And so she feels that she can just kind of get away with this now. But she she dug herself in a little deeper than I believe she has before. And I think it's going to take more than some random veiled apology through, you know, a third party to turn the, the tide of public opinion back in her favor. And so two things for me. I do, and I don't know the case as well as you do just from what I'm reading, from what I've been seeing. Sounds like she might have had some other buddy else on the side because clearly she was living somewhere off the radar for three or four days. And we saw this or however long she was gone. And we saw this with hours, Sher 49 hours, 49 hours. And we saw this with Sherry Papini. There was a guy, right? There was another guy who was, who wasn't aware of it or whatever. So my opinion, just from seeing this. Wait, is do that, you know that there was another guy? No. What I was seeing is that her boyfriend, who was like the biggest, like, you know, promoter of like finding her, all these things unfollowed her, deleted all his pictures off her page. And there were things out there that said that there might have okay. been another guy. So that... here's what I think happened because there was rumors. So that was not her boyfriend. That was her ex-boyfriend, the one who came forward and made that statement about like, oh, my God, I couldn't sleep until I found her. Like, blah, blah, blah. You know that, dude? That apparently was her ex-boyfriend. And apparently her ex-boyfriend cheated on her with an exotic dancer because we see messages from Carly to this other woman basically saying like, you suck, you're a stripper, I'm a nurse, you're poor, I'm rich, you're busted, I'm pretty. Like you, the thought that you thought you could come in here and take my man when you got nothing to offer, like I'm going to show you kind of thing. So I almost think that she did it to get attention from her ex-boyfriend. And when he figured out that he had been worried about her and that it was all staged, that's when he unfollowed her. That makes sense. And and listen, I think that's important to this investigation and whether to decide if charges should be filed and what charges, because you got to try to understand, just like any criminal case, what was the intent here? It's very important. And if it's what you're saying, where there's a real strong possibility that Carly didn't expect it to get as big as it did. I think uh, I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know. Carly disappeared. It was getting a lot of coverage, in my opinion, but there were people out there saying that basically it wasn't getting the coverage it deserved because she was a she was a black woman and that this was a problem in society where if it was a white woman, it would have gotten all this national attention. And so so Carly kind of took on 
a bigger role than I think even she thought she would. She was representing something bigger than herself. So I think they really need to look at what the intent was here. Did she go and sit in a hotel room and this was just because she wanted the notoriety that could come with something like this as a hero who saved a, a toddler that was potentially being you know, tra- trafficked? Or was this a situation where she was just trying to make her boyfriend miss her? I don't know. I we have to the figure latter, that out. Honestly, I don't. Yeah. I don't think she. I think that it took on a life of its own that she did not. She did expect. not. No. One, there's no doubt. She was sitting in a hotel room, like holy shit, or wherever she was. Holy shit, this is getting way too big. I gotta go home. That's probably why she was back so quickly. But regardless, you gotta understand the intent. And I think at minimum, and they've done this in other cases in the past. There is a a lot of money. And a lot of time that's spent by police agencies looking for her. They're, they're around the clock. They're using resources. They're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to find her. At minimum, there should be some type of restitution in play because it's not the police department that's paying for these things. It's you, the taxpayer, that's paying for it. So th- she needs to pay them back. She needs to pay them back regardless of whether she's charged or not. So we'll see how it works out. But I'm in agreement with you. Well, well, she has a Mercedes, so I mean. Well, there's some day, you know, take that in, collateral. But either way. <laughs> collateral. <laughs> yeah, e- either way, I think that she needs to, I'll tell you what, one way to really change someone is to hit their pocket, right? To have there be some type of, res- you can't yeah, but is her- she hit? are they hitting her pocket or are they hitting her parents' pocket? Oh. Once again, is there. Well, that would, is- that would hit hers too, though. Because she ain't mm. getting another Mercedes anytime mm. soon. Or will she? Like, we Depends don't know about her charge, relationship. Depends on how much yeah. the bill is. When they see the bill for $1.2 million. You know, because I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'm not joking when I say those types of numbers. There was probably thousands of police officers out Dude, there crazy. on overtime. Yeah. They probably bought, brought in different canines and all these things that, and you know, gas fuel and like lighting and electricity, all these things. I'm telling you really quickly in a 48 hour period, you can have a three, $400,000 bill easily if it's a big enough operation. Like this clearly was, it was all hands on deck for this girl. So We'll see what happens. I definitely think she should have some accountability other than just like the the public scrutiny that comes with it. Because I think overall, some people, especially people that are willing to do something like this, she probably really don't give a shit what we think. Mm -hmm. The only really to make her see or be impacted by what she did is to have to be some type of penalty for it, some type of consequence. What that is, we'll let the people in charge of the case uh, figure that one out. But I will say that I agree. I don't think she gives a shit. I don't think that... (laughs) Right. I mean, clearly, I don't I mean, she wouldn't be having a birthday party. Right. Who came to the birthday party? Yeah, is what I want to know. I like, saw the photos. It was like cars around the corner. It was all it was a part. It was a packed house. It was a packed house. So do you think the orange headed forest people who took her were invited? Maybe that, you know, they could be laughing about it. That's the scary thing. They could be all laughing about it, making jokes about these the story or whatever. And, and I'm sure she has some I, type of victim story. I'm sure she behind closed doors is saying this is the reason I did it. And I want you to feel bad for me. There's no doubt in my mind. So we'll see what happens. I think the the general takeaway, and I, I tweeted about this before this even came out because I saw the writing on the wall and oh, I put it out there and said, it? you were brave. You, I said, we know where this is going because <laughs> I, I, I've said to you, no, I didn't get attacked at all because it was very obvious by what the police were not saying and how they were, what they were saying and the way they were saying it. So very obvious what was going on. And I just said, listen, unfortunately, these things will happen. All we can do as a society is when it happens again, and what I mean by happens again, when someone like this goes missing under these circumstances, we have to take it seriously until proven otherwise. That's unfortunate. We may go down a a trail that that leads to a dead end, but I'd rather do that than think it's one of these types of situations, a Carly Russell situation, not do it and have a woman or a man or whoever end up dead because we didn't take it seriously because of this nitwit who did something like this or Sherry Papini who Mm -hmm. did something like this. So I don't think that it will affect, I mean, at least not in, in this area of Hoover, Alabama, man, they came out, they, they supported, but I'm saying even like the true crime, I mean, everyone's out there pushing and now the people were pushing it super hard. You can't really blame them. How could they know? But you know, they're out there screaming from the rooftops and, and then sure enough, something like this happens. Although it's not the best look, it shouldn't it shouldn't deter you from doing it again in the future. It won't deter me. If it seems like it's legit, I'm going to push it and ultimately we'll see what happens and if it turns out to be another Carly Russell, 
then so be it. You can always mm-hmm. go back and exactly. fix that. Yeah. It is what it is. Anything else from you? We went long mm-hmm. in this one, but yeah. I wanted to hit that because well, that came out today. One, you know? What's that? A two for one. Two for one. I mean, that's a big one. Everyone's been following that. I know, uh, you know, obviously, if you haven't seen, it's a crazy th- situation. There's video footage. I don't know if you have that in your episode or not, but like, there's video footage of the highway that clearly Carly didn't plan yes, for. Dude, I so <laughs> definitely go watch the video. It's worth and when watching. The, when the police chief was like, while she was on the phone with the 911, she drove the length of six football fields. And he's like, and I don't know about you, but I never known a three-year-old who could walk that fast and that far in that amount of time. <laughs> the minute I saw the video, because if you think about it, if you see something on the side of the road on the highway, it's a very abrupt turn off the road. And maybe you have to actually go in reverse in the breakdown lane to get back to what you just flew by. She's literally in the breakdown lane with the hazards on just in the camera angle that you can see for a quarter of a mile, just kind of slowly trudging along. So I was like, maybe she saw it, got off the off ramp, got back on the other side, got back on. And now she's slowly pulling up to it again. But I I could tell something wasn't right as soon as I saw it. I'm like, oh, not going to say anything, but Mm -hmm. something seems off here. So hopefully she gets the help she needs. But hopefully um, she learns from this. uh, And hopefully we as a community continue to do what we got to do to make sure that if this comes up again, and it's the real thing. Now we're better prepared for it. And the fast actions of everyone involved, we just got to look at it as a practice, right? It was a trial run. So if the, unfortunately the real thing happens, we're ready for it. Yeah, I agree. Cool. All right, guys, we appreciate you joining us. Go check out Stephanie's video on this. It's a good, fascinating story. Definitely got to get the background on it. We're going to get ready to film a new Crime Weekly. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Audio will be out on Friday. And, in, and YouTube will be out on Sunday. This is going to be part two of DB Cooper. And it's going to be the final part. So you definitely want to check that out. Everyone stay safe out there. We will see you soon. Bye.